Welcome back, I'm Chris Moran with HVAC Pro Blog, and this week I'm excited to share a video that I made one year ago for my Patreon members on verifying refrigerant charge. This is the first video in a series of three in the coming weeks where we're gonna talk about saturation temperatures, subcooling and superheat, and measuring and understanding what's going on with the refrigerant cycle. So without further ado, here's part one. Remember, when you're re verifying refrigerant charge, almost every manufacturer in the United States uses superheat if you have a fixed metering device. So for the most cases in the United States, you're talking about unitary manufacturers that used fixed orifices, right? Uh, and then of course, subcooling if you have a TX valve or an electronic expansion valve. Ideally though, you're not just gonna check one side of this. If you have a TX valve, you don't only look at subcooling. You also have to make sure that the superheat is actually being maintained by the valve. So when you're measuring this, you're gonna look at both superheat and subcooling, but when you adjust the charge, you would adjust using the appropriate method, right? Subcooling for TX valves, superheat for fi fixed metering devices. Now, if you're working on um, a system that's made by Lennox or some other manufacturers, they might have a unique uh, way of measuring refrigerant charge. Lennox on some of their systems, starting way back in the 80s, actually started using the approach method. So that would be um, the temperature of your liquid line above the outdoor air, right? So the air entering the condenser. So that is only used for Lennox systems. I'm This is not a Lennox class, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on approach, but I do wanna mention there's other ways of verifying and adjusting charge other than superheat and subcooling, okay? You'll notice everybody these days has electronic uh, gauges. They're fairly cost uh, effective at this point. I would hope you're using these. In fact, if you're doing a lot of ductless systems, you probably want to use the hoseless electronic gauges, not just the ones on the screen like these. All right. Um, I was fortunate, uh, oh boy, 15, 20 years ago to actually get my hands on these very early and test them. Um, and it's amazing how fast you're able to get all of the information and make quick decisions on how a system is operating when you can actually see superheat and subcooling right on the screen. Prior to these electronic gauges, it used to take a while, and by the time you figured out all the math, everything in the system already changed, right? Um, speaking of that, you have to make sure when you run the system before you adjust refrigerant charge, a couple items, right? You need to have a load on the unit. Unfortunately, early in the spring, especially in the Northeast, you're probably not gonna be able to adjust superheat and subcooling. You need it to be probably at least 60 degrees outside with a load, there's gotta be some latent load. If it's really dry, probably not gonna happen. You gotta be able to remove moisture from the coil, get that wet coil in order to then be able to adjust the refrigerant charge. All right, so superheat for fixed metering devices, subcooling for TX valves. All right, so just a little reminder here, and I like to use the example of if I was gonna have a barbecue, and let's say I wanted to boil some lobster uh, out on the grill, right? And for those of you not from New England, you probably get a little kick out of uh, a little bit of my accent. I lost a lot of it when I was in the military, but my wife still has it, and I hear it, and we, we, we bust her out all the time over here. So, um, so let's say we wanted to boil that pot of water, okay? When we have that water boiling, as we're adding heat to that water to get to the boiling point, all right, we're adding sensible heat. Obviously, we need to add a lot more BTUs of latent to get that water to boil off. As soon as it starts boiling off, 212 degrees at sea level, all right, and under no pressure, you're at your saturation point, the point where your liquid boils off into a gas, or your gas condenses back down into a liquid, all right? This is really important, and it's very important for you guys to understand. This is what we call the gauge temperature, or if you take your PSIG off of your gauge and you convert it uh, to temperature on your PT chart, that's your gauge temperature, right? That's your saturation point, your saturation temperature. And obviously the saturation temperature, if we had a pressure cooker, right, and we put that, that water under pressure, we could boil it off at a much higher temperature because it's at a higher pressure. Pressure and temperature are directly related. If it's a really low pressure, it can boil off at a lower temperature, all right? So let's say we boil all that water off and then there's just all steam in there. We're gonna steam that lobster, right? Um, hopefully you're not doing that, by the way. You're gonna overcook it, but another story. All right, so you boil all that water off and then we make that steam 213 degrees, 214 degrees. That's the amount of temperature we added to the 
saturation point, over the saturation point, right? So that would be one and two degrees of superheat. And this is actually measured on the suction line with your clamp, right? You're gonna measure your suction line temperature and you're gonna minus from your gauge temp, your saturation temp. Your suction line temp should always be warmer than your saturation temp, okay? So the amount of heat we add to the to the vapor, right, the saturated vapor, that, that's the superheat. And then the exact opposite for cooling. Once we condense it all back down to a liquid in the condenser, hence the name, right, um, we get it all back down into a liquid, it's at 212, and then we make it 211, 210 if this is water. Obviously that would be one and two degrees of subcooling, the amount of heat we remove below the saturation point, all right? And this would be always your gauge temperature, your saturation temperature on your high side, minus the actual liquid line temperature that you measure with your clamp. Because your liquid line temp is always gonna be lower than your gauge temp, right? Your saturation point. All right, hopefully everybody followed me on that. It's really important that you guys get the basics here. It's all, excuse me, it's all based on saturation. The amount of heat we add past saturation is superheat. Below saturation as we take heat away is subcooling. All right. So. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I wanted to give you a visual. I assume everybody watching my uh, stuff here has the basics of the refrigeration cycle down, right? You're gonna move refrigerant from the compressor um, in through the condenser. It's not exactly like this. It doesn't enter the top and exit the bottom, okay? But I want you to start to think about the indoor and outdoor units kind of like buckets, all right? And there's a pipe in between. If I was to pour water in one bucket, if there's a pipe that connects the other bucket, it's gonna level off in the other one. If you guys uh, deliver oil, right? If you have oil tanks and are at the same level, they're connected with a pipe. As you pump oil into one, it levels off in the other, okay? Same idea here. I want you to think of it this way because I want you to think about when you add or remove refrigerant, you're taking away from both buckets or you're adding to both buckets. It's not just one. Okay, so as we add refrigerant, you can see on the scale on the right, your subcooling starts to go up as you add refrigerant, right? As you add refrigerant on the evaporator side, on the left of your screen here, you're gonna see the superheat starts to go down, okay? So the scale is flipped. Um, and they're both gonna react, especially with a fixed metering device. As I add refrigerant to get my superheat down, my subcooling starts to rise, all right? If I have a TX valve, the job of the TX valve is just to maintain superheat all the time. It might be 10, 12, 15, whatever it is, okay? So typically you don't see the superheat react very fast as long as you stack up some liquid. Two, three degrees of uh, subcooling is enough to make sure you have a steady stream of liquid to that valve. And then you would start to see that that superheat will stabilize and you'll start to rise that subcooling as you add liquid, all right? And it will go quick, especially with some of these micro channel coils. So uh, make sure you go slow and you watch both sides of the cycle because I don't want to keep adding refrigerant if my superheat's getting close to zero with a valve, we know that thing's not working right. That bulb's probably not connected or loose or who knows, right? So we make sure both sides are looking good as we're adding and removing refrigerant. All right, so let's start with uh, superheat first. Remember your target superheat is actually based on a simple equation. Everybody needs, thinks they need the chart and they look inside the units. Um, most, you know, There's a lot of manufacturers out there that do still sell systems with fixed orifices. So before you get this far, during installation, I wanna make sure you know they ship fixed orifices with the condenser for a reason. Right, the metering device needs to match the condenser, not the coil inside. So what you need to do is take that, that uh, fixed orifice out of the coil that ship with the coil and put the one that comes with the condenser in. I used to hate it on maintenance when I'd see that thing still taped inside the unit. Um, I know we don't have the fi right fixed orifice. How am I gonna adjust the charge and get the system running efficiently, right? So really important, make sure the fixed orifices matches the condenser. If you're gonna go through all that kind of work, I used to just put a TX valve in at that point. It'd run more efficient anyway. It add a half a sear to a system sometimes. Um, but once you have the right fixed orifice in, then you can adjust the superheat. And the superheat is based on your return air wet bulb at the unit. Let's say it's up in an attic, you're not measuring in the space. You're actually going up, drilling a hole in the return near the coil um, or, the, or the, uh, the blower motor, right? And in the return close to the unit. So that way we can get the actual temperature, the actual return air wet bulb. You multiply that by three, you minus 80, and then you minus the condenser entering ambient temperature that's outside at the condenser. Once you do that, you divide the whole thing by two, and then you're gonna get your target superheat. 
and your target super heat has a tolerance of plus or minus five. And you need to actually take these measurements and adjust that refrigerant charge fairly quickly because it's very easy, especially under low loads, for all of those targets to change in minutes, right? If you don't like the weather in New England, just blink, right? It changes so fast. So really, really important. Uh, a couple things here, you need to have a dry condenser. So if you just did maintenance, you have to make sure that that coil's 100% dry and clean. You need to make sure you have the right metering device and it's working. And it can't be raining out because obviously we don't have a wet condenser and you're gonna get some really screwy condenser and entering ambient temperatures. So no wrapping the condenser, all that sort of thing that we used to do to test the load. Um, you can't adjust charge that way. You gotta do it correctly, okay? You gotta have a load in the system, walk through that math. Or if you're using the chart, really simple, you get your return air wet bulb on the left on most charts, condensering ambient across the top, and then you follow it down and, and match it up and know that that's your target. Plus or minus five is the tolerance. All right, checking charge and adjusting charge with a TX valve obviously is much easier. Uh, most of the time, the condensers actually have a label on the condenser that tells you what the target subcooling should be. But as you're adding refrigerant, you need to make sure the valve is actually working. You know how many times I've seen loose bulbs, bulbs not mounted to the suction line that are just still strapped inside the coil for packaging. Um, incorrect valves, valves that uh, are the wrong size because they came shipped with the evaporator that's too big for that condenser. Um, it really is important. Verify the valve, the bulb is tight and insulated correctly, installed correctly, and then adjust charge, all right? And as you add refrigerant, you should see that valve maintaining superheat. So when you adjust charge with a valve, with a TX valve or electronic expansion valve, the subcooling tolerance is plus or minus three, okay? And that's based off of the target using manufacturer specs. If you don't have a target, uh, this chart that's on here is a very good default. You know, typically as the system gets more efficient, you don't need as much refrigerant in the condenser because the surface area is so large. That's what's doing the temperature change, not big temperature differences with stacked up liquid in the coil. So as the system gets more efficient, you could go from like uh, eight to 10 sear system if there's any of them still out there operating. Um, you can see I started doing this quite some time ago. Um, you could have a target as, as high as 12, and you could have a 16 sear system these days that might have a target subcooling of six or seven degrees. So here's a great spot. Remember, you're allowed plus or minus three. I'm willing to bet your system's gonna fall somewhere in there, but if there's something published on the condenser, you gotta use that, okay? That's how the system's gonna be set up correctly and run correctly. So what did you think? Did you like part one of the three-part series on verifying refrigerant charge? If you did and you wanna get access to all of these videos one year in advance, you can sign up for my Patreon page for as little as $8 a month and you have access to two years of content. We're talking written blogs and recorded webinars. Don't forget to come back and see me next week for part two where we talk about diagnosing refrigerant charge issues. I'm Chris with HVAC Pro Blog where we provide advice for residential system design, quality installation, and system diagnosis. I'll see you soon.